Okay, thank you very much for that. Thank you for a great foundation presentation as well. Um, so I would like to start off actually with a little bit of a disclaimer <laughs> with respect to the, the, the earlier panel. Um, I was very much appreciating the points of this, to question the, uh, the focus that we have on biomedical innovation approach to some of these challenges at the moment. Um, but unfortunately, the biomedical innovation is actually my expertise, so that is very much the framework of this presentation. But just to make the, the comment that I do believe that there is absolute merit in broadening out how we think about some of these challenges. Okay, now I hope that I have some bringing somehow a positive message to you this afternoon. And also I have very concrete, tangible things that I would love that the G20 would take on board. I might be a little skeptical of this, but if I make my messages clear, then we'll see. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> I don't think this is news to anybody. I will go through some introductory uh, uh, slides about how our medicines are current medicines and vaccines are currently brought to market. Now, effectively, as you know, as a society, we've sort of delegated the responsibility for this to the private sector. Um, so as you see on the, on the, on the axis here, we have money. Um, on, the, on this axis here, we have time. So effectively, uh, how drugs are brought to market now is developers invest an awful lot in the process of drug discovery. So, um, I mean, obviously I will come to this later about actually the fact that a lot of this basic research and early stage research is actually done in academia and publicly financed. Um, oh, what time, sorry. Ah, yeah, yeah, thank you. It's okay. okay, perfect. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, the pharmaceutical industry, the vaccine industries, they spend many years uh, discovering and progressing through development uh, drugs and new vaccines as products go through this stage and become, come closer to actually launching onto the market and getting regulatory approval, these costs become much, much higher. Um, and then the system as it works at the moment is early on, the companies file for a patent on their products and this provides them a market exclusivity which runs for effectively perhaps a decade after that product's reached on market. And that means there's no competition, there's no downward price pressure once the product's available on the market. And that gives them an opportunity to recoup their investments from down here in the form of revenues. <coughs> um, and then obviously at a certain point, then the patent expires and then other players are welcome to come in and to manufacture the products and to produce a competitive um, marketplace. So what do we know? We know that it's very expensive all sorts of contention about actually the figures, <laughs> that these are the, the classic figures, 800 million to develop an, a new product, but it's also very risky. So every, for every one product that reaches this stage, it would take about 10,000 products coming in at this point. <clears throat> um, and in terms of the revenues, it's largely seen, or, or historically the, uh, this revenue here, if it was over a billion dollars, then that was considered roughly a, a blockbuster product. Okay, now, um, this system has been in place since really probably the 1970s, 80s. It's actually relatively new. Um, and it works very well. For certain, for certain medicines that we need as societies, it works extremely well. So, in countries where there's extremely high healthcare spending, as was mentioned earlier, America, large countries, we'll come to this later, that perhaps have large negotiating power with the companies to drive those prices down for chronic conditions. Um, obviously, the, the, the burden of disease is, this, you know, this huge amounts of patients around the world are, are suffering from, from increasingly from these conditions. And to take the, um, the last one, for example, my father <laughs> specifically has suffered with blood pressure now for perhaps 20 years of his life. So he doesn't, not only are lots of people, the chronic conditions, not only are lots of people suffering from these conditions, but my father's been taking this, uh, these tablets for every day for 20 years now. So the, 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 the duration of the therapy is extremely long. 
So there are winners from the system, and the system does work extremely well in many situations. But as you're all aware, there are situations where perhaps this business model doesn't always work so well. Um, so uh, living here in Germany, I'm extremely privileged, much perhaps arguably a bit more privileged than I went when I was in the UK, um, <laughs> to be protected by a fantastic health system. Um, but it, I, when I get sick, it doesn't cross my mind how much the medicines prescribed will cost me because I have a health insurer who takes care of that for me. But if you live in low and many middle income countries, that's not the case. There's no health protection. There's no financing for healthcare. So when you get sick and you get prescribed a medicine, patients pay out of their pocket. On top of that, in many low and middle income, middle income countries, obviously there's very low purchasing power. Not only is there no health financing, but people are poor. <laughs> they can't afford very high prices for medicines. Um, and if you're poor and you can't afford very high prices for medicines, then there's no re this, this possibility, the equation doesn't work anymore. There's no revenue to be generated to offset these investment costs. Um, now, short course of treatments. There are many reasons why this system does not works so well for antibiotics, but one of the reasons is the fact that generally we would take antibiotics for a course of about five days. So that really, in revenue terms, does not generate as much as my father's blood pressure tablets, for example. <laughs> so that, I mean, there, there are more, we'll come to antibiotics later, why, why the system doesn't necessarily work so well for antibiotics, but that's one of the reasons. Small countries, where there are Patients that there are not very many patients uh, for rare diseases, for example, we'll come on to this example later, orphan drugs. If there aren't very many patients, then the volume component of this revenue equation obviously doesn't really work either. Um, specific patient groups, now that's partly to do with revenue, but it's also to do with the, the challenges and complexities of the, running the clinical trials. And the one thing that has been a um, a common theme throughout my career working on this is obviously infectious diseases <laughs> take the brunt of this. And that is partly because the burden of disease for infectious diseases is greater in the low and middle income countries, but it's not only. There are all sorts of economic externalities that I will spare you with there. Okay, so uh, this will be no, come as no surprise to anyone in this room. This was the access movement that Thomas spoke about in his introductory presentation <laughs> earlier. Um, <clears throat> so this is 20 years ago now when 39 pharmaceutical companies tried to sue Nelson Mandela's <laughs> government in South Africa over South Africa government's attempts to try and make HIV medications affordable. Um, but there was, in some respects, there was a positive outcome of this, I suppose, depending on your reading, but some things changed. <laughs> This, this was the first, 20 years ago, the first global acknowledgement, I think, the first political level um, acknowledgement that this system doesn't always work. Okay, and then what's happened since? I'm sort of, I have three slides here going through various phases of that was access. I'm looking at the R&D side now. Um, <clears throat> but great stuff has been happening. If you take the last 10, 15 years, these are very tangible solutions to some of the challenges we're facing with R&D. So the open source movement, bringing together collaborative knowledge, opening, opening things up, um, referring to Anne's presentation about the Canadian development, collaborative development of the Ebola vaccine, for example, that came out of this movement. <coughs> Product development partnerships, DNDI, um, BADA, well, that's slight, <laughs> but anyway. Um, yeah, so there's, I mean, there's been lots of movement. My claim here with this slide is, um, obviously from the regulatory slide as well, uh, from the regulatory side, value-based uh, reimbursement, value-based pricing. Things are changing, but what I would claim, what I will come on to talk about more, is these are incremental changes to a fundamentally broken system. And they're great positive developments and very valuable, but in certain circumstances, I don't believe that they're gonna go far enough. Okay, now this is where my message gets really positive. <laughs> I think we have, we're really in the middle of a fantastic opportunity. And um, 
it's a bit of a messy slide, okay, so the, the, the bottom, <coughs> this bottom bit is really focusing on antibiotic resistance. This top level one here is focusing at um, high level political fora that are, that are thinking about the pharmaceutical markets in a broader sense. Um, and in the middle, some, some key publications, some high level uh, work that's been published in the area. <coughs> but if you put these together, this is unprecedented. <laughs> Look at this, you have all of these uh, political fora and all of these where antibiotic resistance or pharmaceutical challenges more generally have been on the agenda. And having worked on neglected diseases for a really long time, I re I've never seen, I mean, effectively what you have from the previous slide, a lot of very concrete, tangible action. And what you do not now start to see here is you're getting the political momentum as well, the political commitment. And I really think that that is a positive, a positive development that we should all try to seize on. <clears throat> okay, so why? Why has, why has an issue that used to be only a challenge of developing countries, of poor people, why is it that all of these Western governments now have this issue on their agenda? What's changing? Why is it not just about, unfortunately, poor, poor, the poor and the marginalized anymore? So I, it's a complex area. I've reduced it down into four very kind of soundbite areas, and I'll go through each of them. So I think the first of them that I wanted to highlight is actually innovation. We have a social contract with the pharmaceutical industry. As governments, as society, we put the development of our medicines in their hands. And we do this because we believe that this is the best way for bringing the innovation to people. But there's a challenge with this. And that I think this, the point was raised actually earlier, the resurgence of tuberculosis. If you compare the first two lines, lung cancer and diabetes, in terms of the disease burden that they cause globally, with actually how many drugs you see potentially coming to market, compared to the bottom <coughs> couple here that have much higher global disease burdens, you compare that to the really empty pipeline. <coughs> the solution is that the business model works very well when there is commercial commercial return, but it doesn't, that doesn't always align very well to social need. Another question that is, I think, increasingly <laughs> being raised is actually, where does the innovation come from? You know, is it really big pharma? Is that, there, is that, is that actually where these breakthrough new medicines are being developed? And actually, if you look at the figures, you increasingly see that it's actually the small biotech companies, which is where these innovative products are coming from. And increasingly, the model is that the, the, the big, big companies will buy out, will acquire these smaller companies and effectively buy in the innovation. Is that the most efficient model in terms of society for actually bringing those products to market? Well, I don't think any of this will come as a surprise, so I will, I will dart through quite fast. I mean, prices have always been high. That is how the monopoly system works. But there's been increasing, um, increasing backlash, I guess, about just how high these prices will go. And one is the launch prices. So the, you see the example at the bottom is a hepatitis C medication. So $1,000 a pill or $84,000 per course. I mean, we, we live in a very wealthy society with a great health system, but you have to question how many health systems are really going to be able to afford or be able to sustain prices like this. Um, another, another trend that we see is price gouging. Had an awful lot of political attention, particularly during the US elections. Price gouging is basically when you sort of see rather unexplained <laughs> hikes in prices, um, and sometimes even for off-patent off medicines. Um, the, the big one, I actually, <laughs> I chose this particular clip because I was loving the way that the US media were reporting this. It wasn't about 
how awful that these, you know, often children who could potentially have an anaphylactic shock can't afford to, to carry the security pens around with them anymore. It was like, what's she doing to the healthcare stocks of the pharmaceutical industry? <laughs> anyway, um, yes, <laughs> so, depending which media outlets you, uh, you read. Um, so this is, uh, I don't think we have time to go into this, um, but I wanted to, to make a point, and, and I'll come on to orphan medi medications in my next slide, but what you also see is that prices are insensitive to the cost of R&D. So the more, the more and more we bring down the cost of R&D, that we smooth the route to market for this innovation, the prices are unaffected by what happens before. And I think that's important. Um, so this, this perhaps is getting a little geeky and tedious, but this is the, the, the incentives, how, how governments, what tools governments have available to actually change the system is something I've worked on for a long time. And I just wanted to sort of make a couple of points about um, policymakers also needing to reflect and needing to draw learnings from previous uh, interventions in the markets. So as we know, a lot of basic research, a lot of where these new products get discovered is actually financed a lot by governments, particularly governments like Germany, a very, a very rich and, and well-financed basic research environment. We're increasingly working on reducing R&D costs for companies, ex expedited regulatory pathways, um, reduced, site, reduced clinical trial requirements, uh, tax breaks, all sorts of, um, all sorts of uh, incentives and, and ways of bringing that down. Obviously, then it's the health system that pays the prices once the products are available. So we pay again when we use the medication. <laughs> we're talking, and actually I, I defend this, we're talking about reward incentives now, how to top up top up the revenues effectively for companies to, to bring the right products to market. It's very important, but don't, we have to think about all of these as one. And um, I don't see that, I'm very heavily involved in these policy discussions at the moment, and I don't, I fear that we're not taking this holistic approach and thinking about, well, if a, if a company has received funding here and here and here and here, Maybe we need to start clawing back some of this earlier funding or thinking about the incentives in a, in a bit more of a uh, broad sense. Okay, I'm gonna skip that. That's about orphan drug legislation, which is it's a very positive message. This was also a broken market. This was for rare diseases. Less than two, in the US, um, an orphan disease is defined as a disease with less than 200,000 patients affected. There were great, um, uh, 15 years ago, perhaps a little bit longer, um, incentives to actually change this, to make it more attractive for pharmaceutical companies to address these patient needs. And it was a huge success. It worked. There's all sorts of fantastic innovation uh, in place and new medications that were not available. But how much is it costing us? <laughs> there's, um, there's also a risk of overstimulating markets. And my final point is, is actually just um, about market power. It's a slightly crass analysis, <laughs> a slightly crass way of making the point. But um, <clears throat> this is an analysis that the World Bank does of the, the 100 largest economies of the world. And this, this particular data, I think, is a little bit old. But you basically see that some huge corporations... Um, there are as many corporations in this top 100 list as there are countries, if not a few more. And in terms of um, monopoly markets, a lot comes down to negotiating power. The ability of governments to negotiate with the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and another point about the industry specifically is the global footprint. Um, so this is a list of market power in terms of corporations in the world that have that are present, that have affiliates in the most number of countries. And you see there that there are quite a few big pharmaceutical companies in the 
in the top 10, 15. Okay, so I have um, just a kind of, this was kind of a general introduction to R&D and how it works and where it doesn't work. So it's the single biggest and growing item on healthcare budgets. This is a challenge in times of austerity and budgetary pressures. Generating innovation is expensive, difficult and risky. Sometimes the model works well, sometimes it doesn't. It's a powerful industry and we heard earlier of the example of where it's not always so easy for governments because they also have to balance their public health interests with their industrial interests. You see that with Germany and the UK particularly. Um, but I'm not done. <laughs> I know you were probably hoping that was the end, but it's not. Um, okay, so I wanted now to link much better to Christian's presentation um, and to try, I wanted to use that first part of the presentation generally about R&D to kind of make a very specific point about antimicrobial resistance. So they are different, antibiotics are different as Christian demonstrated, but they also present a unique opportunity to us. Um, they don't only treat infections, they're a health system enabler. So they're necessary for the neonate survival, for surgery, for eating healthy meat. The, the, the value is very broad. It's broader than just treating infections. The trouble is the market value for these products is far below their social value. And the externalities are not accounted for in current models. So I'm going, I'm slipping into economist speak, which is probably not very helpful. Um, <coughs> but um, as Christian mentioned, we have to conserve these antibiotics. Just as Christian was mentioning with the risk of development, the more, an the more antibiotic resistance you have, the more consumption there is, the less efficacious the products are. And that is in nobody's interest. Um, infectious diseases obviously are transmissible across borders. So this obviously goes back to the Ebola discussion from this morning. It's enlightened self-interest that we address this. And what <laughs> I think one of the sad truths about this is HIV and AIDS, in South Africa or neglected tropical diseases in Guinea and some sub-Saharan African countries. This is an, uh, the sad truth is this, this is an opportunity for us now because it affects you and I. It affects our politicians, it affects the family and friends of the politicians. This is not unique to the developing world or to poor and disaffected people. The risk of multi-drug infectious um, multi-drug resistant infections is as much a problem for us as Christian demonstrated in our hospitals as it is for anybody else around the world. <laughs> That's very sad, but it pr does present a unique political opportunity. Right, so this is, um, this is perhaps going a little bit too far. <laughs> I work on this all the time, so this is perhaps a personal plug. Um, what, for me, the case with antibiotic resistance is this is the opportunity to really break with the existing R&D system, right? So we've spoken about some of the reasons, but this, this part here is different also. For anti we've seen how this part here doesn't work for antibiotics, but this part here also, the, the distribution, the access, and the conservation of these products, it doesn't work. The system doesn't work here. And so what, what at least I believe we need to do is, um, that, so there are important post-market considerations, right? They, these products, these new antibiotic products that are gonna be developed, I'm confident that governments have already started moving Governments will subsidize the industry. These new antibiotics will be brought to market. But the question is, do we want to leave them being made available to the people all around the world? These will be globally needed products. And do we want the conservation of these products to be left in the hands of the pharmaceutical industry? 
is that really their comparative advantage? Is that what we really want as a society? And I would like to make the point that this really is the perfect opportunity to advocate for a delinkage model. That, that you effectively, the company that brings the needed product to market gets paid a lump sum. That governments pitch together to pool their financing to pay for the product that we need. But then, thank you pharmaceutical industry, you've done your bit, your comparative advantage has been explored. Now we're gonna leave it to public health authorities to actually ensure that the people who get it need it and only the people who really need it are the ones that get it. Um, I believe, I mean, I do believe, I will defend the fact that you need this big pull incentive. You need a huge amount of money, right? At the moment, what you see is a lot of governments are starting to pump a lot of money into the area, a lot of early stage financing, a lot of grants. Um, but the trouble is that is starting to bring along the pipeline in a very general way. And actually, that might not be the best thing. <laughs> the, more, the more antibiotics coming to the market, you're gonna get cross resistance. It might not be the smartest thing. If you put up a, a lump sum of money attached very strictly to a target product profile that really represents the highest public health need here, I believe is actually the, the only way that you're gonna generate the exact products that, we re that society really needs here um, with clawbacks so you don't pay two or three times. Um, yeah, so that, this is why I believe that antibiotics present a unique opportunity for us because <laughs> you can tweak the system. You can tweak the system all you want for antibiotics, but these incremental changes to the system are not really what we need. So, <laughs> this really is my last slide. This is my real closing message. Um, there is an unprecedented favorable political window of opportunity at the moment to show that there are, there are potentially better ways of bringing our products to market outside of the conventional pharmaceutical business model. We've seen that there are, have been great incremental changes or tweaks to the system over the last 10 years, but it's not always gonna be enough. And certainly for antibiotics, I don't believe it is enough. And they will only, I believe they will only be fixed by a transformative solution, but that will take collective government courage. <laughs> and that's where my closing message to the G20 would come from. If they can't get agreement and tangible progress on delinkage, then maybe we could at least get them to pool some funds that may uh, finance that may go some way to financing a delinkage style model. And what would be a real coup, <laughs> like the icing on the cake, is that the solution didn't cover only antibiotics. Like the earlier slides I presented, there are quite a few areas that we've seen where the, where the, uh, where the system, the current business model doesn't work. And perhaps it's time to think about taking up some of these suggestions that have been in place about an infectious disease financing facility or a pooled fund to just genuinely and, and truly address the areas of social need that are not well served by the current system. Okay, thank you. <clears throat>